Join us, friends. Great Scott, Spa Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Spa Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spa Guy. I'm trying to think who I am, Billy. <laughs> I'm globe trotting with Trey, that's it. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there are a lot of people that are. In fact, there was some wigwam that happened recently, but that's a whole different story. Why does people wish uh, that Cotton was a monkey? Man, I don't know why they're wishing Cotton was a monkey, but that is a, uh, a word that we use to describe the world that we live in, this fake world where people pretend like something is something that it is not knowing that it's not, but they're just moving forward with it anyway, for whatever reason, political correctness, whatever it may be. And we're just, we're trying to stamp it out. I'm going around whenever I see it, I stamp and I see it and I stamp and I stamp and I don't really do it with my hands. I usually do it with my feet, but I'm trying to stamp Wigwam out worldwide as we go. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> we'll see how in a few months yeah. so so far it's not working so good but we're gonna see um so friends this is a continuation uh in the last episode we were talking about you know what's so funny is i told trey while while we were preparing to do this one um that we always i always worry that we don't have enough to to say to fill up the 45 minutes for the podcast when we start on a subject, but invariably we always do. And in this last one, we actually mentioned, or I, I shouldn't say we, I mentioned that we would talk about some jobs that some famous people did and we never got to it. So in this, we'll try to tell some other stories real quick. And then Trey, if you'll remind me when we have about 10, 15 minutes left, let's go into that and we'll talk about some jobs that famous people did And so we have time for that. Okay. Sounds good. So what we're doing is a continuation. I was talking about, I worked at a car dealership uh, for a good portion of my adult life. And then I ended up working in the pest control business. And I was going to tell a few stories about the pest control stuff, about funny things that happened. Um, I was hiring employees. And the way that we had to hire employees, because imagine this, Trey. <clears throat> this is a sales job, and it's not just a sales job. Trey, I don't need you to come in here and sell widgets on the showroom floor here. I need you to get in your car, drive to a neighborhood, park, get out, knock on people's doors until somebody tells you it's okay for you to go under their house. I need you to go under the house. I need you to do an inspection, come out, and be able to give them a presentation about what you saw under their house and offer them termite protection on their home and a a treatment and pest control and be able to do all of those things. That's not an easy person to find that, for one thing, will literally go under a house. That's right. So the way I did this, you've actually seen this place before. Um, We drive by it going to the airport. And I don't know if I've ever mentioned it, but uh, the next time we do, I'll try to remember to point it out. So on Briley Parkway, it is now a, I think it's a Marriott. Back then it was a Holiday Inn. And what I would do was rent a room at the Holiday Inn and I would run an ad in the paper. Now this is this is before Craigslist. This is, this is early. So this would have been around 2001, two, somewhere in that neighborhood. So there was ads on the internet, but people were still using the newspaper, okay? So I ran an ad in the newspaper and the ad said $75,000 a year salesman. Uh, Meet at the uh, Holiday Inn tonight in room, you know, we would rent the, whatever the room was, the conference room. And I would have a lot of times 200 people, okay? So I would go over how the sales work, what we were gonna do, The opportunity it was, how they could grow, how we gave them a car, we gave them uh, a fuel card, we gave them this, we gave them that. And and what I would start doing is going, okay, if anybody, so I would do the the basic presentation. I'd go, 
if anybody in this room has a problem with working six days a week, you can leave now. And people would get up and leave. And so I'd go, okay, if anybody has a problem with crawling under houses, you can leave now. And people would leave. And I would go from 200 to five or six. Nice. <laughs> Literally. And then I would take those five or six and I would start them on a training program the next day or the next Monday. And usually I think we would do that on a Thursday night and I would have the, I would start training on Monday morning. Yeah. So what I would do is we would have classroom sessions where I would teach them. You remember what we were talking about? Tommy Hopkins, how to master the art of selling the five steps to a sale. And I would take, then I wrote a sales training manual that we would go through the manual in the classroom. We would actually do play acting where we would simulate talking and, and objections and all that kind of stuff. And selling by the way, is a series of questions. And I'll give you an example. So, um, when you're selling something to somebody, you don't ever assume that you know what they want because you think that everybody wants what you want, right? Correct. But that's not factual. People have varied reasons why they want things. That's why when you go in a car lot, there's white cars and blue cars and green cars. And mm -hmm. there's all these different colors. There's these different styles. There's different kinds of homes. There's some homes that are one level. There's some homes that are three levels. There's some that are on high hills. There's some that are close to the river. So everybody likes different stuff for different reasons. So selling is the art of gently leading someone to make a decision that's good for them. Okay. So it's a series of questions. And so I'll give you an example that I would always use. Um, because this actually happened to me. I was in a guy's house one time and he asked me, his question was, will this pest control kill my wife's cat? So if you were selling pest control to a guy, you're sitting in his house and he asked you, would it kill your wife's cat? What would you say to him? Why do you want to know that? <laughs> no, uh, no, I would, I, I would say, uh, no, sir. <laughs> that's right. You would go, no, no, no. It would. No, it no, sir. I mean, that. this is the type of stuff that's in this. Uh, it's not going to be um, anything lethal to kill an animal. <laughs> that's your what you're saying is correct, but it's not correct from a sales standpoint. Okay, this is the right answer. Do you want it to kill your wife's cat? <laughs> that's the sale yeah okay <laughs> so you know what his answer was when i asked him that yes he laughed so hard it said where's your contract and signed it nice <laughs> that's that, a good one Billy. Story, that did happen and uh <laughs> because i can't assume that he didn't want his wife's cat dead you see what i'm saying yeah i would be thinking like he thought that was the funniest thing that he had ever heard. So I'll give you an example of another another time. We were in a house. I was training a guy. Um, it was I actually had uh, three trainees with me at this time. And what I would do is as I was training people, I would take them on real sales calls with me. And so when we're on these real sales calls, I'm in somebody's house and we're sitting around the table and it's me and three other people in the, in the, the homeowner. You know, and <clears throat> so I'm trying to show these people that my system works. You got to follow the system. There's a way that you do it. There's a thing that you say, and you do it the same way every time. And we were at this guy's house. And um, I got thrown out of the house. The guy got so mad and threw us out of his house because um, I had taught them that that when you give someone a price, and you give them a time frame, and I'm and basically what we would do is say, This is the price tonight. But if I leave, if we leave, this price is no longer good. Okay. And he got so mad because I did that and threw basically threw us out of the house. So it, the 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 joke ended up being on him, and I'll tell you why. This was a very unusual situation 
that I didn't even know that I was in at the moment. But it actually worked out because he lived in a home that was made out of drive it. And drive it is this stuff that you'll see on, on homes. It looks like stucco. And a lot of times they'll paint it like a tan color. And it looks like if you go to the beach, a lot of homes are made with drive it. It's just got that, that uh, tropical look to it. You know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. It kind of looks like stucco. Well, <clears throat> something that had happened is it, around here during that time, there was a lot of homes that were being made with this drive it stuff. And they were taking the drive it and going all the way to the ground with it. Well, drive it is made out of foam, styrofoam. So it's like styrofoam board with a drive it on the front with a backer on it. And that attracts termites. So what was happening was houses that had drive it that went all the way to the ground, mm. we couldn't insure. We couldn't give them, a, we couldn't sell them termite unless they cut, they had to cut it back a foot from the bottom and finish it out and paint the brick to, to match. If you didn't do that, you couldn't get a termite treatment on the house. I didn't know it. I had never run into one. Okay, so this guy's house was a house with drive it. And um, so anyway, we got up and I sent the pictures uh, over to Andy, the stuff that I had about it the next morning, told him what happened. And the guy got mad with us and threw us out. And then the guy called in demanding that price. And Andy told him, sir, I can't sell that to you. What he told you last night is right. We just can't. And, uh, and then he doubled down and said, and the reason is, your house has drive it. You should have bought it last night. If you had a, there's nothing we could have done. <laughs> You'd have had us, but you let us out of there. And, and it turned out that we can't sell it to you because you, you're you going to have to go and have this $5,000 thing done where they cut your drive it back from the ground. And that guy, man, when, he, when I'm telling you he was mad, he was not a little bit mad. He was a lot mad. And, um, but anyway, I had my salesman with me, you know, these trainees, it was a guy, uh, two guys and a girl. And I wasn't going to let them see me not do what I, the rules that I said, you know, I had to follow the, the system, what I said I was going to do. So um, another thing that happened was I had a guy, in fact, it was one of those three people right there. And I don't recall his name, but I can see his face, but he swore to me that he was a helicopter pilot in the Marines. Okay. That he is out of the Marines, but he was a helicopter pilot, but he wasn't very, in my opinion, he wasn't very intelligent. So I don't see how he was a helicopter pilot if he was. But you remember uh, in the last episode, we were talking about being consistent, not cutting corners. Mm -hmm. That when you're out going door to door, you have to, you have to, to be um, hard enough on yourself to be responsible enough to go knock on those 80 doors right. every day. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, to, I can't you know. make you do it. But and if you don't, but if you don't do it, it shows in your numbers. So something that I didn't tell that um that I brought up before was 80 doors, 40 people, 10 pitches, two sales. There's a point where, as a salesperson, if you keep up with your numbers and you're consistent with it, you'll be able to predict your income. It literally will say if you knock on 80 doors you're going to make this amount of money. So if you up it to a hundred doors, it's going to make this much more money. You could literally do that after it takes about six months of keeping up with the numbers, but there's a point where it literally becomes real. The numbers become real. And it's kind of like my businesses now, you know, I have these e-commerce businesses and my businesses, it doesn't matter. You can, I can predict Today, what my website or a website, I have several different ones. I can tell you today what that website is going to sell next September. Just because I've done it so long that it's created a pattern of numbers. And those numbers now, I can add product. I can do some other things to raise those numbers. But it's somewhat automated where you're just going to get X amount of sales no matter what you do. I know. At some point, as long as you or is consistent with it. So anyway, this particular guy, I was trying to think of his name um, and his, it's not coming to me, but anyway, um, we're going to say David. I don't think that's right, but maybe it was David. So every morning the salesman had to come into my office and sit in front of me. And we had pieces of paper that they filled out 
that showed every address that they went to. So they had to say, I went to uh, Maple Street and I, I knocked on door 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, yada, 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 on down. And this was even before Google Earth, really. This would have been prior to Google Earth. I don't know when Google Earth started. Um, and maybe I just didn't know about Google Earth then, but I don't recall being able to look it up the way that I'm going to describe it. Um, so he was knocking on houses in an in a area close to Nolensville, Tennessee, but his sales was dropping. So you remember what I told you? If you based off of these numbers, if you do that, those numbers, you're going to have X amount of sales. But his numbers were dropping off his sales numbers. So I knew that he was not doing what he said he was doing. So I literally one day I had a talk with him that morning. I said, man, I don't know what's going on with your numbers, but you can't be doing what you say you're doing. And he swore me down. No, I'm, I'm knocking on those doors. I promise you I'm doing it. And I said, OK, so. He went off that day. So I took his sheets, went to the neighborhoods. And I want you to know there was one side of the street. There wasn't even houses. <laughs> he couldn't have knocked on the, the addresses were on the sheet, but there's no houses. <laughs> so of course the next morning I, I had to, to part ways with him. But anyway, um, it was stuff like that all the time. And I have, I'll tell one more story about this and we'll go back to the car dealership. Because uh, we're we're running out of time already. That fella probably has a doctor on his name on Facebook now. <laughs> yeah, he's got a doctor hey, degree. Hey, he's way smarter than that guy. I'll <laughs> say that. Doesn't take much. That's a fact. So um, another guy, and I do not remember this person's name, and I felt so sorry for him when all this happened. But I have to hold you have to hold people to a standard. And the guy's thing was. He needed a job bad. He needed to make money for his family, which I, I understand. I had a heart for, for teaching people and trying to help them to be able to make money and do well. But this guy was terrified, Trey, to crawl under a house. Oh, boy, tell me. So about that's that. a problem. That's a problem in that job. <laughs> when I thought you asked. You're terrified. I did. But we're in the middle of trading. He's with me, and we go to this house. We what I did to try to help him was we would go to just a random house to crawl under. Well, he wouldn't go under. So I thought, you know what we'll do? We'll go to your house. I thought maybe that would help him. So we went to his house and he would get some of the way under there and then he would come out just terrified. And uh, he finally crawled under his house and got the, you know, you got to crawl under, do your inspection. Then you come out and you measure and you do the treatment. So the other thing that I had problems with this guy was you, I had to teach them how to draw a graph. So you get this graph paper and you measure the house. And let's say the house is each block on it was one square foot on the graph. It was one of those graph papers that's blocks. So let's say the house is 50 feet this way. So each block, when there's 10 blocks, that's 10 feet. So you would go, you would go 50 blocks down. That's 50 feet. And it may be this big on the, on the thing because um, it would be much small, you know, smaller. So you could draw a 50 by 70 or whatever. And then you would take the linear feet around the house. And that's how you came up with the price. It was X amount of dollars per linear foot. Um, so after we got through the crawling part and all this kind of stuff, I would teach them how to draw graphs. And part of your homework was you had to, or your schoolwork there, is you had to draw this graph. Well, he finally, after maybe 50 tries, was able to complete the graph that was on the board. Oh, wow. Okay. And the guy was ex-military. Seemed like he was Air Force from my memory, which, you know, as I mentioned, I was in the Air Force, and I think he was he was retired Air Force from my memory. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so I turned him loose to go sell and we sent him and he sold something the very first day. And what was so funny was some of the other students were down on me for keeping him. They were like, man, I can't believe you kept that guy. He's terrible. He, he wouldn't crawl under a house. He couldn't learn to draw the graph. And I'm like, guys, the guy needs a job. He really does. And I'm going to give him an opportunity. 
And I talked to my boss, uh, Andy Douglas, and told him what was going on. He was like, man, just put him out there and we'll see what, I mean, he can't really mess anything up. Not really. And <clears throat> so we sent him out there the first day he made a sale. Um, and so I'm the next day I'm talking to these, I'm talking to all my people and I am, uh, going, you know, he made a sale. Do you two guys make a sale? And they hadn't their first day out by their sale. And, uh, so I'm bragging on this guy. So anyway, my termite guy goes out there to treat the house that he had drawn the graph on. And he goes, this house is not. It just so happened. It's kind of like one of those things, kind of like the, the guy with the drive it house. It's one of those oddities where this was not a cinder block house. On the houses that have cinder blocks, they're hollow. And the termites can come up in the hollow. So what they do to do a termite treatment is they'll drill holes in the block and put liquid in the blocks. You'll stick your wand in and put liquid in each block. So you have to drill holes. This particular house was concrete solid. And he had sold a treatment like it was a block house, like they were going to go drill. And he called me and he said, man, there's, he said, there's something wrong here with this thing. He sold a, uh, a fill treatment instead of a, a, a perimeter treatment on solid concrete like that. What you would do is treat on the outside and then treat on the inside with liquid because it's solid. They can't come up through the concrete. So I told him, I said, well, hang on. I'm going to drive out there and, uh, and look and see what's going on, see if I can figure out what happened. So I get out there to the house and um, I look and I go under the house and I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the graph and I'm like, what? This graph does not match this house. What is this? And it hit me. You know what the graph was? What was it? It was the graph that I had taught him to draw in the classroom. <laughs> he had learned to draw that. So that's what he drew. That's what he drew. Cause that's all he knew how to draw. Oh man. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so how did you handle this? I had to fire him because he just couldn't do it. And that customer, that customer was so mad because the treatment that he had sold him wasn't right for the house. It was a disaster. So we learned a lesson from that. And you had just pumped this guy up. And <laughs> oh, you think I didn't hear that with the other guys? And I was like, I tell you what, though, guys, that he at least made a sale. Y'all still haven't made a sale. That is true. Oh, yeah, so hey, I don't want to hear anything. He made a sale on a fake house, but he yeah, he he was so good that he sold on a fake house. <laughs> did you ever, when you ever crawled up underneath a home or anything, did you ever see any kind of snakes or? You know, I was very very fortunate because you know Trey, I don't care for snakes. No. I don't either. Um, so no, I did not run into that, but I had people that, that did oh. uh, run into stuff like that. Uh, I had a guy that worked for me that was actually a preacher and he preached on the weekends, but he worked, uh, as a, uh, a guy there. And when I say he worked for me, he didn't really exactly work for me. He kind of did what I did. He was a door-to-door -door salesman. Like when I was running this, he still worked for the other branch. He told me about when he was in Texas that he was under a house treating it. And you know how, I don't know how many houses you've ever been under, but the old school ranch style houses, when they pour the front, the front porch, you know how they'll have the front porch to be concrete on top. They'll brick it and then they'll, they'll put a corrugated metal in it and they'll pour concrete. So it's yeah. four inches thick, but it's hollow under it. Yeah. And usually they'll throw all of, they'll throw the scrap wood, from the house, they'll throw it in there. They'll throw all the scrap brick under there. And then they'll put that corrugated metal and pour concrete on top of it. And a lot of times they'll take a piece of wood and put it up against the um, the opening under it from under the house. Because you can get, usually the, it's open to the porch under the house. So he was under the house treating it. And he was going to grab that board. Because what we did was any wood that was under the house, we would take it out because it would attract termites as part of the treatment. So he said, he told me he's grabbing on that wood and he was doing like that and it was hard and it finally broke loose and it, and he fell back like that. And when he did, that hole was full of rattlesnakes. Oh, <laughs> and I've never seen anything like that, but he did experience that right there. And, um, what did he say he did? It, well, I just ran out from under the house, got out quick as he could. Man, yeah. rattlesnakes in a yeah. hole up under. Oh, it's terrible. Time. 
under a person's and, home. And Ooh. one of the things that I did, and I want to make sure we got enough time to tell a couple of dealership things. Um, one of the things that I did as a salesman, you know, I told you that I had the, I sold the most of anybody at one point. I got a camera. Um, <clears throat> I won a sales contest and I took the money from the sales contest and went and bought me a Panasonic camera. It was called a super disc. It had these floppy discs in it and it would do 10 second bursts of video and it would do um, pictures and you could hook to it. It had a cable that you could hook to the camera and it would do the yellow and red. You know how you hook to the back of the TV, the RCA, mm -hmm. and it has audio and sound. I would go into the house and take pictures if I saw uh, termites or if I saw damage and come in the house and say, can I use your TV? And I would hook to the TV and take my camera and show the pictures on their TV. Well, that's cool. And the video on the TV of termites under their house and that kind of stuff. And that's how I sold a lot of stuff. That would sell it. That would sell it right there. And it did. It did. It made it, it, it really boosted my sales at that point. So, um, but anyway, the pest control business was, uh, was quite interesting to say the least. Uh, so let's go back to the car business. I had a guy similar to the guy that I just mentioned that was, um, his last name was, Adams. And I, I, I'm not going to say his first name, but I would sing the uh, Adams family song to him. The creepy and the, the But anyway, he I hired him as a service writer and he just, he struggled with just basic stuff. So I told him when winter was coming and I was like, Hey, I need you to go out to all the cars on the lot, the used cars. And I want you to go out and check the antifreeze and let's make sure that the antifreeze is good in all of them because winter's coming and we don't want these cars to freeze. So that's at the very most, you go get the keys. Maybe there's 50 cars out there, maybe a half a day. He worked on that for three days and came back with a graph. He had drawn out all these charts and pie charts and graphs about the degrees of how much antifreeze each car needed. It was the craziest stuff I've ever seen. Just, just wild stuff, man. <laughs> wow. People are different, Billy. Mm -hmm. I had a guy named Jerry that I was going to tell you about. This made me think of, uh, uh, earlier when I was talking about Jerry, this made me think, think of a funny story about Jerry. Jerry was the guy that looked like uh, Jethro Bodine. And he would get upset. He actually lived, he was in the Air Force. He was retired Air Force. And he was a mechanic in the Air Force and great at his job. The best I've ever seen. No Hands down. Nobody better. But he did not want to be bothered. He didn't like music playing while he was working. He didn't want to see customers. He just wanted to be left alone and he would get his job done. And he would, when he put a car out and said it was done, it was done. I could call a customer with confidence and I knew that we were good, no problem. And he was just that good. And um, I hired a guy to uh, do automatic transmission repair. Remember I said I did automatics, but I hired a guy that his father um, had uh, built automatic transmissions. So this guy had a lot of experience. I thought, well, I'm going to hire somebody that could do this so I don't have to build them. But part of my hiring thing, when I hired people, I said, now, one of the things we don't do in this shop is play radios. Um, I have a mechanic that that bothers. He is the guy. He's the king. And so we don't play radios. So this guy, after about a week, he puts a radio up there on his thing. And he starts playing it. And he's on the other side of the shop from Jerry. You know, there was, the dealership was wide. There was lifts on both sides. So he's on the other side of the shop. But it was loud enough that it was bothering Jerry. And so I saw Jerry. I heard him get kind of loud for a minute. And then I walked and I heard that guy go, Hey man, what are you doing? And so I went over and I looked and Jerry went over there and turned his radio off. <laughs> you know? So I remember I walked over there that day and I said, man, when I hired you, I told you we don't play music in here. If you want to listen to music, get you some headphones, a Walkman, whatever. That was before cell that phones, before that or, you yeah. know, you'd have had to have a Walkman back then, you know? And, um, so this was, uh, Way, way back. So he said, uh, okay. So about two days later, I uh, I heard a ruckus. And Jerry walked over there and grabbed that radio and snatched it. We had, the building was made out of metal. And it had about, about five foot up, maybe not quite, I'm going to say five feet. There was a ledge. 
and you could sit stuff on the ledge and we had plugs around. So the ledge was above the table. The tables would be up against the metal wall and then you could sit stuff on the ledge and his radio was on that ledge. I saw, I heard Jerry go, I told you. He went over there and grabbed that guy's radio, snatched it out of the wall, snatched the plug out of the wall and took it to the middle of the shop and just wham in a thousand pieces right in the middle of the shop. And that guy ran over there to me and he said, man, we could do about that. I said, you're fired. That's what I'm doing about that. Get you fired him on the spot. Sure did. Yeah. Wow. I told him, I'm telling you, man, you're not good. You're going to mess with Jerry. Are you, you crazy? You're you going to mess with my Michael Jordan. Yeah. You're not messing with my Michael Jordan. You yeah. know, like, you're the bitch player over here. Mm -hmm. You're messing with MJ. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Hey, hey, Jerry was adamant about his music when he didn't. <laughs> Jerry, when Jerry said no music, guess what? There was no music. Hey, nobody else did it, did they? Nobody. Nope. And so some other things that happened, and we'll, we could probably do a whole episode on just things that happened at the dealership. I worked there most of my adult life. Another thing that happened was we had these diesel escorts. You know what an escort is, a Ford escort? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Ford made escort diesels, Tempo diesels, Ranger diesels, Lincoln diesels. Most people probably don't know that. I didn't know that. But we had a guy that had a fleet of diesels, Robert Hill Construction Company. He had a fleet of about 8,000 vehicles. Oh, and man. so he would buy vehicles from us a hundred at the time or 200 at the time. Big and so he was a big customer for us. Yeah. And uh, they would bring those cars in to get oil changes. Well, those diesels would start in gear if they were stick shift. And uh, my guy changing the oil um, had it in gear, didn't realize it and changed the oil, reached in and, and turned it on and it cranked up and ran into the wall and dented the hood and both front fenders. So we just so happened to have another Escort diesel that belonged to them that was the same color that we were doing a head job on. So we took the fender and the hood off of that one and put it on this one while we were doing the oil change and let that guy go. He never knew his car got wrecked. <laughs> and then we fixed the other car. <laughs> Man, Billy. We had all kinds of stuff like that happen. And um, <laughs> it was... Uh, I, I, mean, wish you were, I wish you were filming back then. Oh, yeah, man. I could have had, and I do have, I, I found a little footage of me there. And I, it's, man, I was young. You it's to, hard to believe how young I was at the time. Put that together. Yeah. And by, I've got VHS now. What I'm doing is taking my, v, uh, my VCR tapes and turning them to digital. And I found some footage of me at the dealership recently. How cool would it be if you even, if you thought about it back then and you just filmed with VHS tapes? But you just filmed all these, all this footage. Yeah. And then now you could go back now and put all this on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And I filmed a lot of stuff back then because I did have a camera, but a lot of the VHS doesn't do well with age. So I have right here to my right, you can't see it. Uh, I sit here and move it to this computer. I have five VCRs right here. Yeah. And the reason is, is if it doesn't play in the first one, I'll try the next one. And usually, my v, the VC, VHS tapes will work in one of these. In one of those. Yeah. And so I'll just figure out which one it works right and then move it to digital. So I've been doing a lot of that recently. All right. So I've got plenty more stories about that kind of stuff, but let's go to some jobs for famous people. So first let's talk about Elvis. So tell them some things that Elvis did. Well, I know from one of his two friends at Lauderdale Courts, that they started a little uh, uh, grass cutting business, mm -hmm. and Elvis cut grass there while he lived at Lauderdale with uh, Buzzy and and Paul and uh, Farley, and Paul uh, Dewar, mm -hmm. and that that came from Buzzy and Farley. Mm -hmm. And he and definitely Elvis, did that. Elvis that was, was probably great. back when there was no gas in it. It was the Beaver Cleaver lawnmower. You know why I didn't think about that. Okay. Yeah, I bet you is what it was. Yeah. So think about that, Billy. Some of the uh, probably, you know, some of the lawns that we pass on our uh, Memphis uh, bus here when we uh, do it during Elvis week. Um, probably Elvis has been out there cutting, cutting the grass. grass before. That's wild. Wouldn't it be cool yeah. if we knew a place. Yeah. yeah. He definitely did. So I know he did that at, at, <clears> at a certain <throat> point. Um, also, of course, you know, everybody, of course, knows the truck driving the crown yeah crown electric which he started d delivering but he ended up doing what you filmed a story about this yeah um he ended up doing a uh electrical work he was an apprentice electrician 
mm -hmm. electrician. Now I hadn't put that out yet, but there's going to be a really, uh, I found a place in Memphis <clears throat> that he did Elvis did the, the wiring. Elvis mm -hmm. did the light wiring mm -hmm. in the place. It's still there, man. So I, I, I've captured that. He assembled furniture. For uh, what was the name of that company? That's over behind the uh, where the train station was. That was um, MB oh Parker. yeah, the glass. The MB the, Parker. MB Parker. Yeah, he MB worked at Precision Tool. What about the place we found uh, last time in Elvis Week? Uh, where this is what I'm talking about. That's where he assembled furniture. That was MB. Right? I think that's MB Parker. I may be wrong about that, but no, I think MB Parker right. is that other factory. Yeah, MB Parker's way out there on the uh, on the yeah. So. What is the name of that place? Um, but he assembled, we know that he worked at Precision Tool. It was something metal. Uh, it was a metal, like a metal company. Yeah, it was Marl, M A R L. Yep, that's Marl it. Marl Metal Company. That's right. But he also worked for MB Parker, mm -hmm. which was an assembly job. And then they, they built, they did um, at the at Precision Tool, they made ammunition. Yeah. It was one of the things that they made. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So That's he cool. did a lot of stuff. So how about some other people? How about well, Elvis Bruce? also was an usher at the movie theater? That's right. He did. He worked as an usher. That's you know right. he loved that job. Yep. And the name of that place was Lowe's State Theater mm -hmm. on Main on Main Street. Yep. There's a bank building there now. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. That's right. Right there is literally a block from Bill. That's right. Very close. Block from Bill. Yep. Two, two, yeah, one block from Bill. You're right. It's just yep. one block. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, last week we talked about Bruce Lee. Yep. When Bruce Lee came uh, uh, from uh, China to um, to the States, you know, he was born in the States, and then he went and grew back up over there. Then he came back later on. Uh, I think he was kind of out of control in his teenage years over there, so they sent him here to America. Oh, you don't want Bruce Lee out of control. And no, exactly. And uh, so he, he had, he worked and lived at a restaurant in Seattle. Wow. And he waited tables and he worked in the kitchen. Can you imagine Bruce Lee waiting on you and you not tipping him? Yeah. Are you smart off to him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have a list of a couple of different uh, celebrities. Uh, one of them is Brian May. The guitar player for, do you know? Brian May, that Speech Boys? No, Brian May's the guitar player for Queen. Queen. We are the champions. You know we are, wow. Well. And Brian May made his guitar, by the way. That famous guitar that you see, he made that. Uh, uh, he is a, an astronomer by trade. Okay. How about, um, and this is interesting to me, the young lady, her name is Mayim Balik. She she was Blossom. You remember the TV show Blossom? Yeah, yeah. And then later she later she went on to be Amy Farrah Fowler in The Big Bang Theory. Do you know what she is? No. Nope. She is a neuroscientist. Oh wow! Okay. So when she's playing a scientist on The Big Bang Theory, she's really a scientist. She really is a neuroscientist. Wow. Bruce Dickinson. I don't know if you're familiar with the band. Um, uh, the, the famous song, uh, uh, Trooper would be one of their famous songs. He's the front man for the heavy metal, uh, group Iron Maiden and Troopers. Uh, I don't know if you recognize that. He is a professional pilot. Oh, wow. Okay. And then Steve Buscemi. You remember Steve? Who's that? A famous actor. He played, man, he's played in so many different things. Um, he's a, one of those character actors like we talked about that um, that you would recognize because he plays all these. He's in a lot of movies. Um, let me see if I can come up with something real quick that he was in that you would recognize. Yeah. Uh, but he was a he's a firefighter. So some of the uh, things that he was in, and I'm sure people are screaming at the at the uh, uh, radio right now, or they're they're you finding it? Yeah, he was in um, Boardwalk Empire, Nurse Jackie. Uh, what's some of the movies? 
he was in Big Daddy with Adam Sandler, Ghost World. Um, he did he did a lot of Adam Sandler stuff. Uh, Spy Kids, Sopranos. I think uh, I can see his face now. Grown Ups with uh, Chris yeah. Rock. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. He was in Mr. Deeds. Man. I love his thing in Mr. Deeds. Yeah. Um, Hotel Transylvania. Just a, a ton of stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> some other people. Gwen Stefani worked at a Dairy Queen. Dwayne The Rock Johnson was a dishwasher at a pizza parlor. <laughs> Jennifer Aniston was a telemarketer who sold timeshares. Eva Longoria worked for Wendy's for six years at a Wendy's. Yeah. Wouldn't it been, have been awesome to pull up to a Wendy's and Eva Longoria was there to hand your hamburger to you? Brad Pitt handed out flyers for an El Pollo Loco restaurant. You remember seeing those when we were in the <laughs> Brad Pitt did that one? You remember that? Did we eat it? Yeah. Do you remember that thing we ate late at night and got some uh, some of those tacos? That was El Pollo Loco. The crazy maybe that's thing. the one Brad Pitt passed out things at. It, it may be. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's see. Kanye West folded sweatshirts at the Gap while he was in high school. Yeah, that's perfect for him. Oh, uh, Barack Obama scooped ice cream at a Baskin Robbins. <laughs> Meghan Markle was a calligrapher. Nicki Minaj was a waitress at Red Lobster. Really? Yeah. Some of these people I don't know. Alec Baldwin was a waiter at Studio, Studio 54. Margot <laughs> Robbie was a sandwich artist at Subway. Whoopi Goldberg was a morgue beautician. <laughs> so she, she put makeup on dead people and fixed their hair. Tom Cruise was a bellhop at a hotel. He was about the right height for that. Yeah. yeah. Terry Crews was a courtroom sketch artist. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey exterminated armadillos for a golf course. <laughs> Melissa McCarthy was a Starbucks barista. Um, Mark Cuban was a bartender at a club. And now look at him. He just made so, some deals the other day. <laughs> yeah. So these people... The the point of this whole thing is, friends, and we almost bypassed it. up, boy. Thank you. That was cool. Thank you very much. I was about 30 seconds late on it, but we're still there. That means we got about three minutes left. But the point of that whole thing is, friends, if you have a dream to do something, I had a dream to uh, create a business. I had a dream to uh, be a musician and a singer. Trey had a dream to play basketball. Trey had a dream to be an actor. And we fulfilled a lot of those dreams. So if you have a dream, all those people that I just mentioned had dreams to be actors and actresses. and But they had to do what they had to do to get there, right? And what did McConaughey do again? He, he exterminated. He was an exterminator for <laughs> armadillos at a golf course. <laughs> all right, all right. He all right. played Bill Murray's part. And uh, but he was doing armadillos instead of groundhogs, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> All right, wow. But yeah, hey, dreams are main. Uh, you know, are meant to. You have to go after them. But it takes. Uh, you said the word while ago, being consistent. Um, hey, and it might take you 150 times trying. That's right. But that 151st, well, your dream may come true. Yep. Consistency, friends, is what makes you successful. I promise you that if you pick something and you stick with it and you go for it, it you will be successful. And nowadays, if you're struggling financially, I promise you there's no reason to struggle financially nowadays. There's so many people that are so bad at their job or won't work at all that sticking out and growing and moving to the top of a business is not hard to do. As I mentioned, I started out as a mechanic at a dealership and knew zero about cars. And in two years, I was a service manager. Yeah, I'd heard uh, somebody had told me yesterday that one of the restaurants in our town, they were saying that it's just the hardest part of their of, of that business was it can't get anybody to work. Nobody yeah. will. Yeah, they won't come. They'll hire people and they just, nobody will come work. They just don't show up. <laughs> and so that's, <laughs> And, and back in the day when I was growing up, 
you didn't do that. Well, <laughs> you had that on a minute level. There was a few people that wouldn't do what they say we were going to do, but it was a very small number of people. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> um, and I've got one more story before we go that I'll tell you. But let me let me finish my thoughts. So I went from a mechanic to running the place. Uh, in the pest control business, I went from knowing nothing about pest control to running the place. I went from in the hot tub business, knowing nothing about hot tubs, to having a, a large hot tub com, uh, e-commerce company. And we still sell other things, but now I focus on e-commerce. And my company ships about 3,000 orders a month. I've seen Billy's numbers. I've seen, I've, I've, I've seen calls and how much you've sold in one day, Billy, man, you're, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. And last That's year awesome. I actually acquired, I bought another company. So I ended up bringing another company in with my company that was mm-hmm. already successful selling hot tub parts. So I've increased the size of my company. Yeah, and you brought in new workers. You brought in with that. Well, other now company. I don't have to answer the phone because I hired mm-hmm. people. I brought, I bought a company that had people that manned the phone. So yeah. I don't answer the phone anymore. And that was your, uh, you know, those when we go and film, you would constantly get phone calls every five minutes or yeah. four and a half minutes. And now I bet that's your favorite part now. It is like, a dream to you not eliminate that. You let you pay somebody else to do that. It's a dream not to have to answer the phone. But my point with all this is, is dream big, go out and be consistent, find something that you're good at and exploit it. And I don't mean using, I'm not using the, the, you can exploit something in a good way. You can learn how to make money doing anything, but find something that you're passionate about. Trey and I are passionate about telling these history stories. So because of that, we've had some success with that kind of stuff. So I want to go back and tell you one more story that I just thought of. I had a guy that I hired as a mechanic and he, let's see if I could, I want to remember this story in the right way. This guy was um, really, really fast. And when I say fast as a mechanic, the way mechanics are paid, and we're running a little bit over, but I think it's worth telling this story. The way mechanics are paid is they, they have a, what they call a Chilton book. And the Chilton book may say to replace this water pump on this car, it's going to take two and a half hours. So you charge your labor rate. Let's say the labor rate's $100. You charge that $100 times two and a half hours. So it'd be $250 labor plus parts. And that's how you price out a job. Now, you may have a guy that it takes four hours to do that two and a half hour job. He still only gets paid for two and a half hours. But you may have a guy that can do that job in an hour. Mm. Okay, so I had this mechanic, and I don't recall his name, but... um, he could do stuff so fast, it would blow my mind. And for the most part, if he said it was done, he would put it outside and it was done. He was really, really good, really fast. But he he would do crazy stuff. Like I would have it planned because he was, I was excited that he was there because I could, I could go, okay, well, I got these three jobs I need to get finished. I'm going to give them to him and he'll knock these things out today because most people that take two days, he'll do them in one day. So I would give him those three jobs and say, hey, man, I need you to take care of these three and get them done today. He would do one and I'd start looking for him and he's gone. He'd go home. He'd just leave. And and uh, so I put up with him for a little while um, to the point where um, what I'm saying is because he was so fast and he did good work, I let him kind of let the tail wag the dog a little bit for a little while. And I finally fired him. Okay. So years later, I was talking to somebody, this guy's name came up, somebody that I knew that knew him. This was years after I was gone from the dealership. And they told me this story, but I will say this. He, he got a job at a place uh, as a uh, security guy. And his job was to go in, log in, work security in this building all day and then log out and go home, right? So what he would do is he ended up getting fired because he would go log in and go home. And he'd come back in eight hours and log out. <laughs> he would do stuff like that. So, uh, but <laughs> I told you all that to tell you this. <laughs> this it is very crazy. It turned out this dude was crazy. And we had things missing. He had this toolbox full of tools 
he had tools that you shouldn't even own that a dealership owned. Well, it's you know, and I would go, so you got that? How? Well, yeah, I was over at such and such and they sold it to me. What well, turned out he was a thief. Okay? <laughs> so I had a guy that I ran into that was next door neighbors with him that was telling me about it. He said that, uh, he said, uh, and I'll finish with this. This just tells you, man, there's such crazy people out there. Mm-hmm. And the sad part is, is this guy was so good at what he did. He just, if he'd have just done it, man, he would have been so successful. He just wasn't honest. But he wasn't honest and he wasn't consistent. He wouldn't He wouldn't focus on what he did really well. He wanted to try to cut the system, you know, to cut corners in the system. But anyway, this guy told me that in front of his house, he had two um, um, lawn chairs. Uh, you know, you remember the, our, our, not lawn chairs, but the chairs like you would put on your, your patio or your front porch that are made out of metal. Yeah. And they look like um, the pattern in them, they have holes in them, square holes, and it yeah. looks like it's wo- woven, but it's actually metal. Really yeah, it's woven. metal. Yeah. And they're usually two-tone. They'll paint them green with white stripes mm-hmm. in the in that part, that kind of stuff. So he said he had two of those uh, things on his front porch, and he had um, in the front, have you ever seen those silhouette cutouts where it looks like Grandma bending over in the garden? You'll just see her butt. Have you no. ever seen that? That's no. a That's a thing. For that's a southern thing that people would put those in his garden, and it looks like the garden ladies bending over working on the flowers, but it's just a silhouette of an old lady's butt. Okay, okay. so one day that um, that thing got missing, and his chairs got missing off of his front porch, and he was like, and he looked, and those two chairs had been repainted, and they were on his front porch. Okay. <laughs> And the silhouette was gone. And he went over there and confronted him and said, hey, there's my my chairs. You repaint them. No, no, those are my chairs. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yeah. And, and he said, well, where's the silhouette? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Years later, he was, he was um, uh, plowing his garden, tilling his garden up. And he tilled that, that silhouette up. The guy had stolen it and taken it and buried it in the garden. So he didn't want it. He just wanted to steal it. You know, so, man, I've run into such crazy people uh, oh, yeah. out there. At least, at least you can say you fired that more, Ren. I've fired a, over the years a lot of people. I'll say yeah. that. Hundreds. But you didn't just fire them because you were a jackass. You oh, no, them I fired them because they couldn't do their job or they weren't good. Weren't not good at their job. No, I yeah, but you know what I'm saying. You know, yeah. you know, you didn't fire them because you just, that's how you are. You no, fired them because they, they didn't run the business. I need mm-hmm. people that are good at what they do. Exactly. Good that, at what to do, you got to go. Or you're not honest. So we're, li- or not honest. So yeah. friends, we're a little bit over. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll talk about some other things one day. It won't be the next episode, but one way we'll talk about some other stories. Because man, at that dealership, I mean, I, li- I grew up there, Trey. When my kids were born, I was there. Yeah. When I got married, I worked there. Wow. And so I worked there, you know, all of my adult life till I moved to Nashville. And uh, boy, the stories, so many things happened at that place. I mean, just wild stuff. Um, I, I Something that just came to mind. I can't tell that story right now because we're out of time, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. Let's so friends, that. thank y'all so much for watching and or listening. Tighten up every chance you get. and. Don't wish Cotton was a monkey, but I know a lot of you still will, unfortunately, so don't double dribble.